Welcome everybody to the Impact Festival. You have come here to see one man, he's sitting over there. Um, I didn't know him before, but I did find out that there was a name popping up in newspaper clippings, um, a cryptic name, um, kept popping up in the news. A name associated with scoops about the downing of flight MH17, the war in Syria and Yemen, um, assassination attempts by the Russians, all kinds of different things. This weird name, of course, is Bellingcat. Within the four years of their existence, Bellingcat has managed to redefine the field of investigative journalism using techniques normally associated with intelligence agencies and spies and actually doing much of the work that these intelligence agencies maybe should be doing. Here to give you a peek behind the curtains of how this group works is the founder of Bellingcat. Please welcome Elliot Higgins. Um, so, hello everyone. Um, uh, to begin with, I've been asked to tell you about an upcoming workshop um, that will be held. Um, once my slides come up. There we go. Um, so, Impact are holding a Bellingcat workshop. They've asked me to uh, let you know all about it. It'll be on November 13th, 14th and 15th. Um, it's got a discounted price for students. If you want to participate, uh, you can go to the URL. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is some of the tools and techniques that we use. Um, explaining how we come to some of the conclusions we come to. Um, so we've broken down the process at Bell and Cat into three uh, stages, identify, verify, and amplify. So I'm going to be talking about all three of those stages today. So identify is really about finding information online. Um, verifying is obviously verifying it, and there's all kinds of ways we do that. And amplification can be anything from a single tweet uh, to a 100-page report or an hour-long video. So I'm going to start off with a very simple example of geolocation. Geolocation is a key um, verification uh, process that we use, where we examine the content of an image to figure out exactly where it was taken. Um, and this allows us to confirm that there whoever took it and said it's, it's in a location is telling the truth. And this is one of the first videos I ever geolocated when I was back doing this for fun. Um, this is from TG in Libya in 2011, where rebel groups claimed they had captured a town. Um, so I wanted to see if this was actually TG and not somewhere else. So there's certain features that we look at to begin with. We're looking at the larger features that are visible in the video or the photograph to help us narrow down where it could be. So in this case, we have a mosque with a dome and a minaret. It's next to a road, which is two lanes, and it's obviously wide enough to happily fit a tank. So we're going to look at TG, and we're looking for a large road running through it and a mosque on it. So we first look at the map, and we can see straight away there's a large road. We zoom in, we can see uh, it's two lanes. We can see it's got multiple car lengths in it. And as we move down the road, we eventually come to a mosque with a dome and a minaret. So that allows us to narrow down the post possible locations it could be. So once we have that possible location, we start reviewing the imagery again, and start looking at smaller details. For example, the curve in the road, the wall that's visible, the various posts and poles that are also visible, casting shadows in the map. Um, so we start with those larger objects, those bigger clues, and narrow it down so we can see the smaller and smaller details. Um, there's another way we can do uh, geolocation. This is a video from Syria. This is, in fact, the first ever video of something called a barrel bomb, which is an improvised explosive device flown out of the back of a helicopter. Um, the thing is, most people watching that would say that's just someone's pushed over a bin. It really doesn't look like much. So you had articles like this, like Bomb Baloney on Russia Today. So as part of the process of investigating this, I was watching lots of videos from Syria looking for more evidence of this kind of munition. And this is one video from 2012 that you can just see a bow bomb being thrown out of the rear of this helicopter. And eventually this video was published, which is filmed inside a helicopter as a bow bomb is being lit and pushed out the back. The question is, how do we know where this is actually filmed? It could be anywhere in the world. Um, what clues do we have? Well, what we have is this top-down view of the town they're dropping the bomb on. And what you can do is search through satellite imagery and find the same location. And that's actually what someone did. They spent quite a lot of time looking through this imagery uh, until they found the location in question. I'm glad it wasn't me. Um, and if we rotate it and pull it side by side with the other image, we can see that this is the same location with the same road layout and the other details. So we can confirm this is a town where this bomb's being dropped. Um, this same method was used in another case. So when Russia started bombing Syria in September 2015, um, they said they were there to bomb ISIS initially. So 
people were saying you're not bombing ISIS, you're bombing over locations. So Sergei Lavrov said, do not listen to the Pentagon about Russian airstrikes. Ask the Russian Ministry of Defense. And in a way, that's what we did. Because the Russian MOD had a series of videos they were publishing on their YouTube channel. And each of these were described as being targeting ISIS. And as you can see, they're top-down views. So similar to what was done with the barrel bomb example, there were a group of uh, about four people on Twitter whose hobby it is, is to geolocate these videos using that same kind of method. So in the first 30 videos that were published by the Russian MOD claiming to be ISIS targets, they discovered through geolocation that only actually one of those videos was showing a target in ISIS territory. But what's ISIS territory? It's very easy for us to say, well, it's not in ISIS territory. Well, again, we go back to the Russian Ministry of Defense and this map they published. And this map shows ISIS territory according to the Russian Ministry of Defense. So when we were saying it's not ISIS territory, we were using this map. And the way we used it is in Google Earth, you can actually overlay uh, images. And what we did is we overlaid the image of the map, then basically drew around the edges, took it away, and we had this nice Google Earth overlay. So we would search for videos from the Russian MOD, geolocate them. This is one example claiming to be an ISIS facility that's being bombed. Um, this was actually caught on camera, which was quite unusual for these bombings. So this is the moment of that very same mo moment, film, a bomb filmed from the ground. So we geolocate it. And we go and look at it on our map. So it's zooming into the location. As you can see, it's already zooming past the uh, ISIS territory in the east. And it goes to this location. And this location is not an ISIS facility. It's, in fact, a, uh, a bakery run by the Turkish charity, the IHH, that they had bombed. Um, so what you see there is one technique being used uh, in another way. Um, there's another technique we use. Um, the Caesar photographs are a collection of photographs that were um, smuggled out of Syria, showing basically lots of corpses that were documented by the Syrian government. Um, most of them are corpses on the ground um, with very little detail around them. But one photograph showed... Uh, the background. Um, there were bodies on the ground in the foreground. I've covered that up. But what was interesting here is the background, because it was claimed these bodies were de being documented in a few places in Damascus. And we wanted to see if this is one of those locations. So you might just be able to make out in the distant hills two objects. They're very hard to see. But due to their height, I, I assume they should be antennae of some sort. And there's only one hill in Damascus with two large antennae on it. So again, in Google Earth, what a lot of people don't really think about is the terrain view in Google Earth. So if we put the camera on the ground at the suspected location, what you see are the hills in the distance. And what I was able to do is in, on the, this particular hill, there's two antennae on satellite imagery. And on those antennae, I put a 3D model just to show exactly where they were from that point of view. And when you do a side-by-side -side comparison, you can see there's this very strong similarity between the two. And again, we go back like we did with the TG example and start looking for little matches. Um, one thing that's very popular for open source investigator are colored boxes, because we use them to tell uh, people where the matches are. So what you've got here is an example of a lot of colored boxes, but each of these are items that we've matched off in the photograph and the satellite imagery. Um, and this confirms it was in one of the locations that was described by the person who smuggled the photographs out. What was really interesting about this is its location, because this, just to the north, is the presidential palace inside uh, Damascus. And this location, where they were documenting hundreds of corpses killed by the Syrian government, was only f just over 500 meters away from the Syrian government's uh, the Syrian Assad's, uh, presidential palace. Um, so we used that same technique in a completely different case study. Um, so this was posted on Twitter. A BBC journalist was saying that someone had gone missing, in, a family had gone missing in the British Virgin Islands. Um, their family hadn't heard of them for a couple of days. Um, they'd just moved there, and they hadn't given their new address to their family back in the UK. So they just disappeared completely. And all we had to tell us where they were was, was this video. So. Not too much to work on, but enough, because in the distance, you can see these. These are islands, and we can do the same technique that we use with the um, uh, Caesar photographs, where we use terrain view in Google Earth to find the location. So we go all around the outside of the islands looking for the possible location. And someone on Twitter who was doing the same thing found this space. And this shows very similar looking islands, but this isn't good enough. We need an actual photograph of this location to be sure. So um, using a tool called EchoSec that allows you to search for geo-tagged um, social media posts, we found 
this photograph. And it was a lovely high-resolution image, so I downloaded it, and we can do a comparison to what's visible in the video. And we can see there's a very strong similarity between the um, image in the video and the photograph. So this tells us this is a possibly of location, and nowhere else around that island looks the same. Um, so we start looking around this area. What other clues are there? Well, we can see the roof. It's got this very particular wooden structure. It appears to be a residential property. There's also this uh, balcony uh, banister as well. Um, but what does that tell us? Well, it's likely a residential fat property. It's a family. So let's look at the area again uh, on Google Earth. We can see just on over here is Pockwood Pond. It's uh, an industrial estate. You can see lots of trucks and other things there. Here you would see the boats in the foreground of the video, so it can't be there. And the other only location it could be is this place called Havers, which has got lots of lovely homes, cars and driveways, and swimming pools. So there's not many photographs tagged in that area. There's no Google Street View. So I needed another source of imagery. Um, so I started looking up estate agents and Airbnb um, to, because they had lots of lovely photographs of people's homes in the area. So I could look at all the balconies, the designs of the homes, all those little details, and see what, if they matched in the video. And eventually I came to this property. And what we have here is one of the photographs, and we can compare that to what's visible in the video. And we see a ma match in style. And all these railings are actually very different in all the houses, so this was very important. If we also look at the roof of the house, we can also see that same design of roof. The problem was I was looking at this and all these photographs, and it just didn't match what was visible in the video. It didn't make sense. And all these houses appear to be unique. All the ones in Airbnb I was seeing were unique designs. But then I looked at its neighbor, and I realized the design of this house, there was an extra swimming pool and a small building, but it's exactly the same as the house just next door to it. So I thought maybe this same house is exactly the same design with the same banisters. So we got in contact with the estate agent who was selling the house on the left-hand side. Turned out he had just sold the house that was to the east to the missing family. And the missing family had been evacuated a couple of days earlier as the storm was hitting the island. And thanks to that one video, we were able to put that missing family in contact with their family back in the UK. So um, another technique we use um, this is a tweet from George Papalopoulos. He was one of Donald Trump's flunkies who got involved with the Mueller investigation. Um, just before he was uh, uh, arrested, um, uh, he posted this tweet on the 25th of October 2017. Uh, hashtag business, um, and he was in London, in outside Harrods. It was very easy to figure out where he was. It's a very well-known location. But we wanted to figure out why, just a few days before he was arrested, was he posted about being on business in London? And October 25th was not a nice day like that in London. It's uh, horrible weather. So what's going on? Well, the lamppost here gives us our clue. Because what we're trying to do here is not geolocate it, but date it. So what a lot of people don't know about Google Street View, and this is a lamppost in the picture, is there's actually historical imagery on Google Street View. So what you can do is go back in time and look at different dates, um, looking at that lamppost. And we discover something very interesting. In July uh, 2014, the stickers on that lamppost match the stickers in the photograph. In May 2015, those stickers are gone. And in March 2017, which was the most recent image we had, those stickers are still gone. So it actually looks, in fact, that that photograph was taken in 2014, which again raises the question, why did he post it in 2017, just before he was arrested in the Mueller investigating, saying he was there on business? Um, we use that um, in a recent uh, case we did. Um, you might recognize these guys. They are the Scripple suspects who were suspected of uh, poisoning a, a former Russian spy in the UK. Uh, we've done quite a bit on them. So Ruslan Bosharov and Alexander Petrov were the names that were given by the UK government. And they were, after they were revealed by the UK government, they appeared on Russia Today to say they were actually sports and nutrition salesmen just visiting Salisbury Cathedral um, twice in two days. Um, so we investigated these guys' IDs. And we discovered that their real names were not Alexander Petrov and Ruslan Bosharov, but Alexander Mis Miskin and Antolie Chapiga. So we've been digging around, looking into these guys, what they were up to. We found all kinds of interesting information. But there was a, um, a report in the media about this Facebook page belonging to Ruslan and Bosharov, the same name as one of the Scripple suspects. Now, there might be many Ruslan Bosharovs in the world, um, but we wanted to find out what we could about this. The reason this came into the news is because this young woman said um, she was actually approached by Ruslan Bosharov, who basically tried to pick her up. He, she said, 
follow me on Facebook, so he started a Facebook page just to follow her. Um, probably not a great idea if you're a Russian spy, but you know, who's to judge? What's really interesting about this post picture, though, um, it's taken in a very well-known square in Prague. And it was posted online on October 11th, 2014. The Czech media reported the ripple suspects, including Ruslan Boshirov, visited the Czech Republic and landed on October 11th, 2014. So now what we're trying to do is, is this photograph actually from October 11th or could it be from an earlier date? So what we're trying to do here is figure out the date of this photograph as close as we can, verify when it was actually taken. So what information have we got in here? This square is very well traveled. There's thousands of photographs of this location, video footage, all kinds of stuff. So we're looking for a detail that was changing in this photograph, like those stickers on that lamppost. And we found it over here. That just looks like some black spodges, but in fact, it's this museum, an art gallery, which you can just make out here on Google Earth, um, satellite in, um, street view imagery from November 2014. And what we're looking at are two black squares that were either side of these in the other image are now gone. Um, we believe we could use this to date the image, but we needed sources of images. So this is another way you can look at lots of sources of imagery. The most common one everyone knows about is Google Street View, where you can just find lots and lots of imagery. Um, but you can also use a site called Yandex uh, Maps, which is a kind of Russian Google, and that has lots and lots of images that are geotagged to the entire location. You just go to maps.yandex, and then you can find all these lovely images. You can also use um, the Russian social network site, vk.com, because you can actually search by coordinates and see who, have, who has posted um, photographs close to coordinates that you have, which is very useful when you're looking for uh, Russian military encampments, for example. Um, you can also use Foursquare and Yelp and other websites that people post reviews on, because sometimes they post photographs. And because this is a well-traveled location, lots of people are posting images. And you can, again, use EchoSec to search the location and find as many pictures as you can. So what we had then was just a massive amount of imagery showing that same museum. And over time, we could see the signage was being changed. So in June 4th and June 14th, we had these two images that show um, this signage there. And it changes on June 17th, 2014, to show much of Wall and Dali exhibition on, with those black marks either side. And that what looks like we can see in the uh, Facebook photograph. We can also see a June um, Street View image from the same date. So what we can tell by doing that is this image must have been, the image on Facebook must have been taken after June, but it must have been taken before October 11th because that's when he posted it. Um, so what the details are there? Well, you can actually see the clock. Uh, there's two clocks in the picture, so it tells us the exact time uh, the photograph was taken. We can also see uh, the people in the photograph are wearing uh, winter clothes. And we can use websites like this that have historical weather imagery for Prague and start going through looking for cold days. And the first really cold day we could find was in August uh, 2014, uh, August 11th. But there are very rarely cold days. So what we start doing is narrowing down the possible times it could be. Now, this is something we've just done recently. We're just using it to demonstrate how you could do this technique. If you wanted to be a bit crazy, what you could then do is look at the people in the photograph on the Facebook page and then look at all the other photographs you found from the same day and see if you can find those people in the photographs which would confirm when the photograph is taken. Um, but I haven't done that yet because I've been doing some other things which I'll show you in a minute. Um, so we, there was a ISIS social media campaign a couple of years ago where they encouraged their supporters to take photographs of them holding up a piece of paper with a hashtag on it, um, basically to create a campaign of fear saying there's ISIS members all over Europe. So um, this is a sample of the images. The first one, you'll never geolocate that. If you can, you can come and work for me. Um, <laughs> the second one, I can't tell you much about that. I can definitely see there's a tin of quality streets up there. You can see the purple ones up top, but that's pretty much all I can say. But this one is geolocatable. And with this one, you have to, again, use um, unusual platforms, I would say. So there's details you can see in here. You can see there's traffic lights. You can see there's a bus, so it's probably on a bus route. It's saying it's in Munster in Germany. Hopefully, he's telling the truth. Otherwise, it's a bigger job for us. Um, so what you can also see is an advertising poll. And um, this is Germany, so obviously, everything's very organized. And they actually have a website with all the advertising locations on in Germany. <laughs> so you can use that website to systematically search for each location. So here we have every advertising poll in Munster. Unfortunately, there's 
hundreds of them. Um, but then you can actually start searching for them one by one by looking through all the different satellite imagery. So we're looking for an advertising pole on an intersection. And we can find one here. And uh, we can start searching through this. So the camera is in this position. And then we, we start moving foot through. We can start seeing details in the background. Um, we can see the railings behind uh, the pole. We can see the road markings. And we can also see the road markings are in the right position to make sense for the camera angle. We can see the traffic lights and the other traffic lights across the road and lots of other details. Um, what was really interesting about this is there were four photographs that um, I shared on social media and asked my followers to look into, crowdsourcing the solution. And four of those uh, photographs, uh, one was in France, uh, one was in Germany, uh, one was in the UK. And th those three took 10 minutes to find because there were so many people looking at them with so many different ideas, they found them in seconds. Um, there was one more that took an hour that was actually taken in uh, Ship at Schiphol Airport in some uh, apartments nearby. That took an hour because he lied about his location. He said he was somewhere slightly different. But we still found it in an hour using crowdsourcing. And crowdsourcing is something that's very useful for Bell Cat. It's a tool that we use all the time. We ask our audience, can you help find stuff? And there's different kinds of crowdsourcing. Like the uh, example I gave earlier when we had the airstrikes in Russia, that's a certain kind of crowdsourcing where you've got a sc small group of people gathering all this information and you can kind of direct them to do something. Here, this was like just asking a question. We kind of give them a simple task. Where is this location? And they, people share that and people figure it out. Um, this is another crowdsourcing task. Um, this is about the Europol Trace an Object Stop Child Abuse campaign that we've been helping with. So Europol um, started this campaign where they're taking these Im items that are that featured in abuse imagery. Um, it was basically the last chance that they had to find any information about the photographs they had. Um, they asked the public if they could identify these objects, just these small fragments of objects. They could be anywhere in the world. Um, what we did, we saw they were doing this, and because we have a large audience who are interested in investigation, who get involved with crowdsourcing, we shared these images with them and asked them if they could help. And in fact, they could. They found many of these items. I think they found about 70 to 80% of the items over the last year. Um, in fact, we've even been able to identify one suspect and one victim in this as well. Um, one of the most impressive examples of this was this hotel room. This is a rare example where they show the entire image. but um, because we were able to crowdsource this, it took about an hour for someone to recognize this location. And this is a hotel room in the island of Mauritius in the middle of the ocean. And it just happened one person visited the same hotel. And even though you see the bed sheets are different, it's clearly the same design of hotel room. And uh, it was confirmed this was the location that was found. But again, that took a matter of minutes because we could crowdsource this answer and it was a very simple question. Um, now there's another kind of crowdsourcing. I don't know if you've um, heard about this story in the US in the last three days or so about the MAGA bomber. Um, he was arrested yesterday. He's basically been sending, I think it's 13 uh, parcel bombs um, to various figures like, um, as you can see, there's uh, John Brennan, uh, Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, George Soros. Um, basically, people, um, people Donald Trump really doesn't like. Um, so a lot of people said, well, he must be some sort of pro-Trump people. And the pro-Trump people are saying, well, it's obviously a Democrat false flag. Um, but yesterday, he was arrested. And uh, this is what he looks like, Caesar Altier Sayoc. Um, when he was being arrested, his van was taken away. And this is his van. It's absolutely covered in stickers. So everyone wanted to see what was on these stickers, because there wasn't much information about him. But this was basically his Facebook page on his van. So um, someone, so, so basically, I spent last night, this is all happening last night, just deep diving into his social media account. And this is an example of how much information you can glean just from all these little, just looking at his social media accounts. So how do we know this is the guy's van? Um, well, one useful thing was someone had actually seen this van before and took photographs of it and was sharing it. Now, I haven't verified this is the original person who found it, or it could just be some random person claiming he is. But this is the side of his van, and we can figure that out by doing a few things. Um, if you compare the back of his van in that photograph to the one showing it being taken away, on the back windows, the top half of the windows match. Everything's in the same position. You can't read the text, but you can see the flags and other symbols are there. But there is a difference in the bottom half of his van. Now, we don't know where these photographs on the right-hand side were taken. Um, but there's more clues that we're able to find. So for example, this, it's the same type of van. It's clearly got the same details on it, not just the lights, but everything else is the same. So whilst I was looking at these images, someone else went off and managed to find his Twitter account. Um, 
which is quite remarkable. Um, you'll see he describes himself as a currently booking agent, sales, marketing, promotions, project manager, live events, seminal hard rock. Keep that in mind for later, because that's a weird little twist of this. Former professional soccer player, wrestler, and cage fighter. Um, and all these details match his profile. We can see him in a photograph. It's blurry, but it kind of looks like the guy. It's got the same name. He's from Florida. Um, so we can start digging into this social media profile. So it's very tempting to just start just scrolling through stuff, looking for the fun stuff. But start with the very first tweet on his page. So this is the last tweet he made. Uh, it's about George Soros. It's about a particular uh, political candidate. Um, it's various images that he shared. But what's um, interesting is what he's replying to. This is jumping down the rabbit hole of this guy. It's very strange. So, we unconquered Seminole tribe, entire hard rock, millions of our customs say absolutely no to Andrew Gillum, can't handle his own city. It isn't co coherent, but the, again, he mentions that tribe. And that again, will that will come up again. What made him post this stuff? Um, it was this video from TMZ. Hey, if you would have taken uh, Kanye's invite to the White House, what would you want to talk to Trump about? Uh, I guess the blatant disrespect and disregard for my people. Okay. And all people of color. You know what I'm saying? I guess maybe we could talk about the children that have been ripped away from the parents at the borders and how they've been allowed to be adopted by other parents and not given back to, you know, to the, to, to their rightful to their rightful homes. I guess, you know what I'm saying, something like that, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. You know, yeah. things that, like, really matter. I think that's, you got to start there before we can move on in good faith. So if you looked at his Twitter account activity, a lot of it was replying to sites like TMZ any time there was criticism of, of Trump. That really seemed to have enraged him a lot, which might explain why he was targeting people who were targets of Donald Trump's uh, attacks. Um, there's more information on here. So he, he mentioned that tribe. So I was saying, I was wondering, what the hell is it with this tribe? Well, he posted this tweet and this image from it, Unconquered Seminole Tribe for Florida. He, throughout his whole history, is claiming that he's part of this Native American tribe. Um, the Native American tribe has said he's not a member of their Native American tribe, so he's been disowned by uh, his, both his political and his uh, ethnic tribe, I guess you could say. But what's interesting here is the flag that's visible is also visible on his van. Um, so, again, we're seeing more examples of this, and you can actually just make it out here on this photograph as well. So now we're actually finding more and more connections between the Twitter account, the photo of his vans taken by the other person, and his actual van. So I started thinking, you know, what, what else can we find out about this guy? What inspired him? So occasionally he would take screenshots of articles and post it. So this is one example of that. And I looked at that, and there were two um, things that stood out. The Event Chronicle, as the editor, and By Silence is uh, Consent. Now, what you find with a lot of kind of um, alt-right websites, alt-media websites, is they'll repost each other's articles. So I suspected the Event Courier had reposted an article by a website called Silent is Consent. This is a fairly typical thing you see it a lot. Um, the Silent is Consent website is interesting. The article in question wasn't on their website when I looked. And the most recent article was actually about the mail bombing suspect they appear to have actually influenced. Um, and this is their Twitter account. It's really odd, I think, this account. I haven't looked into this because this, this is literally something I'm doing now. There's something su suspicious about this account because the articles, some of them have been reposted from other websites. I suspect this website is basically a content farm that basically republishes other people's content and generates cheap paid content that you can basically pay kind of uh, Indian kind of journalism schools to just churn out articles for a very low price. I've seen this happen a lot in all kinds of different situations. Um, I suspect this might be a fake website used to rile people up so they can get advertising revenue from them. And this actually happens a lot. So I, this is something I'm looking into. I'm not 100% sure, but it's just another aspect of his social media history that can be jumped into. Because it would be very interesting if he was being influenced by a site that was basically producing fake news to make money from Trump supporters. Um, so I was looking for uh, the correct website. I couldn't find it on Silence's Consent. Um, I found another copy. This is from the um, website that's mentioned, the Event Chronicle on the right-hand side, and that's the original copy. So it's clearly not the same layout for the article, but I was unable to find the original article. But someone managed to find in Google Catch, which is basically the last search Google's made of a website, this image. This is the catch copy of the um, article that he was quoting, and they deleted it from their website. 
this was actually still, it was cached on October 22nd. So it's very likely they deleted the article from their website when they realized it was on his Twitter feed. But this is other ways to kind of explore the information around his online activity. So um, he, we can also see the article was actually published by signing his consent from their own website as well. So we know it's on their website. So we've got multiple sources confirming this story was on their website and it's gone now for some reason. So that's another little aspect we can look into. And whilst I was looking into that, someone else found his second Twitter account. So he's got two Twitter accounts. Now what's interesting here is he's got 1,082 followers on this account, uh, or following on this account, and they're everyone you'd expect to it to be, Sean Hannity, Donald Trump, well, everyone in the Trump family, um, every kind of right-wing politician you can think of. Um, and you can tell it's the same account. For one thing, it has, again, part of his name in it. Um, if you look at the photograph on the top banner and you look at the he's in the suit on the left hand side and you compare it to this image you can see it's the same people in the image so he's used the same situation as his banner image but he's only following 32 people on this account and they're just kind of generic accounts you would follow if you had just started an account and clicking follow 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 and i think what this could be it appears this was an account um, that he was using you see he's joined february 2015 he created this account afterwards he was probably using it to get around blocks so you could, it's just you know what people do sometimes. It just seems this is the nature of that account. But again, it's something to dig into. And we can tell it's the same person's account for a few reasons. Um, on the right-hand side, we have the original account. And on the left-hand side, we have the same memes being shared within 24 hours of each other um, that were shared on the other account. So it seems he's running these two accounts. And in fact, on this new account, he posts this image. And this image is from his van that we've seen elsewhere. So all these pieces of information are coming together to verify the relationship between each other. And this is just looking for his Twitter feed. Finally, we had people saying uh, like this, are you serious? The van was plastered in pro-Trump images as if someone purposely made it look as conspicuous as possible. So it's this false flag theory that's been coming up. But we have someone in 2017 who actually posted a photograph of the same van. So it required a year of preparation for this false flag. But again, using all this information, you can confirm stuff, debunk stuff, make connections. Um, and th this is literally just something I did last night in a few hours, just whilst I was passing my time lonely in my hotel room. Um, but it's the kind of interesting thing you can engage. And the, one thing I did was, with this as well, I did a Twitter thread on it. So when I was, I was going through this step by step, explaining my discoveries, people were leaping in with their own discoveries. So by engaging with this online community, I actually made a kind of more interesting case. Um, so Someone else we looked into was uh, this guy. Um, so during the Charlottesville um, white nationalist march um, in 2017, there was uh, various crimes committed and we were looking into the people who did them. And we want to look into this guy in particular. Um, what we did first of all is we went through all the photographs and videos that were, were published from Charlottesville and turned it into a, basically a giant database for us to search through. And then we looked through every single photograph and video looking for this guy. And um, we found him. So um, fortunately for us, he was wearing this white helmet with these very distinct stickers on them. And you can tell it's a customized sticker job. He's wearing the same shirt. Uh, we've got this white helmet, and then we've got these stickers as well that are all in the same positions. Even though they're blurry on the left-hand image, it's clear that you know, it would be very unusual for someone else to be wearing the same shirt and helmet. Um, he's also wearing the same color trousers, but you can't see it here. Um, it still doesn't tell us who he is, but he appeared in another image. So uh, how do we know it's the same guy? Well, there's certain distinctive features we can look at, like the moles on his neck are in exactly the same position. Uh, he's, wearing, he's got the same ear shape, which is also useful, and he's wearing this dog tag chain as well. So we can say these two people are the same person, but that doesn't tell us who he is. So we kind of assumed if you were going to go to a white nationalist march, you'd go with your friends. So we started looking at the people who are around him. Um, Fortunately for us, and again, this is kind of another way of crowdsourcing, um, someone else had actually found the identities of these people, and we were able to double check this. Um, this is one guy, Jacob Dix, and this is his page, and we could see from the many photos on this page it was open, so we could do the same comparison. And this is Ryan Martin, someone else. Now, Ryan has kept his friends list empty. Even though he's no friends, but his friends list is empty. But Jacob didn't make his friend list empty, and he's friends with Ryan. So we start looking through Jacob's friends, seeing if there's any other connections. And eventually, we find this guy, Dan Doc Borden, uh, incredibly smug. Um, and we look at his friends list, and he is friends with Jason, and he is friends with Ryan. So now we have this uh, little group of friends, this uh, menage a trois, um, at this nationalist right rally. 
And as you can see, there he is uh, with, again, the same marks on his neck that shows us it's the same person. Um, so we discovered his name is Daniel Borden. So what happened to Daniel Borden? Well, this is what he looked like before. And this is what he now looks like awaiting sentencing for the assault that he was uh, found guilty of. And he'll be sentenced in January 2019. Um, so another thing we try and do is when we have an odd piece of information, we try to verify it. And this was a very odd one from the Turkish coup. So um, this was a video that was published by a journalist who said he got his hands on the phone of one of the po uh, coup coup plotters. Um, so he was um, scrolling through it, and it's a WhatsApp conversation, supposedly, between all the clue potter, uh, uh, coup plotters. And that's insane. Who would have a WhatsApp conversation to plan their coup? Um, but there was an awful lot of text. I mean, as you can see, it just keeps going and going. So we were thinking, well, maybe this is genuine. If it was just like one page, it would be odd, but this goes on forever. Um, so my colleague, Christian Treiber, he um, basically put out a call to help, to help transcribe this, because we don't speak Turkish. And eventually, we had a group of people help us translate the entire conversation from Turkish to English, which meant we could start working with it. So we had information, uh, tweets like this. Some were kind of more obvious. Um, Traffic trying to enter Istanbul would be halted and turned back. Uh, and access to the first bridge from the European side has been halted. If you know Istanbul, that's a big deal, because Istanbul has two, at the time had two bridges, and if you block those bridges, everything grinds to a halt. And they did this at 9 o'clock in the evening, which is still a fairly busy time, um, and people started posting on social media about it. This was the first time I'd actually seen this happen. I was in um, Turkey myself at the time, so I, I had an interesting evening. Um, so this is... This was being posted online as this stuff was happening, and you can see from the timestamps that it was matching up. But the thing is, everyone knows this happened, so we wanted more obscure details. So 66 is on its way. 212 has been passed. What does that mean? Well, we started digging into it. What could 66 be? Um, something we noticed is a lot of the number plates uh, in Istanbul began with 117. And often when you have military number plates, there's an actual system behind them. So we went to the uh, worldlicenseplates.com website where license plates nerds gather a huge amount of information. These websites are hugely valuable when you're looking for a tiny obscure piece of information. Um, and we had the format of the um, number plates used in Turkey by the military. And we discovered that the um, number plate beginning 117 belonged to the 66 mechanized infantry brigade. And you can actually double check that it's actually them because they have a Facebook page with <laughs> photos of their vehicles on. Um, but what does 212 is pass mean? Well, we Googled 212 Istanbul. And what we discovered when we did that is it pointed towards an electrical outlet called 212 on a main road, as you can see here. So we used again EchoSec. And what we could do there is search that location at the time that um, WhatsApp message was made to see, did anyone film anything or photograph anything there? And in fact, they did. Vehicles passing by that location were photographed and shared on social media with geotags. And that cr could be cross-referenced against um, the statement on WhatsApp. But not everyone was quite you know, into the coup mood. Um, this person was posting amusing photographs in the WhatsApp conversation, but he got told up, Mamet, let's not share non-essential photos, OK? <laughs> We don't know what the emoji is. It's been lost in time. But um, I like to imagine it's a little sad face. Um, so Erdogan gets on uh, his phone and calls up CNN Turk, which was um, not what they were expecting. They'd actually already captured the main um, Turkish television TV station, but they hadn't captured any of the cable services. Um, so he got on and he told all his supporters to go out on the streets and support him. And that actually started happening. It was a really big moment. And things started falling apart. And this is where it got really nasty. So, crush them, burn them, no compromise when they started coming out on the street. But, come on, Mehmet. <laughs> and they're saying, they're having serious discussions, saying, buying opening fire will hit three or four, five, but we won't be able to stop them from entering. Um, and the person who shared that, um, we, we'll see later, but something else was interesting. This was posted um, talking about a location in Istanbul. And at the same time this was posted, this incident occurred, where soldiers um, basically shot someone who was trying to protest against what they were doing. And this seems to be related to that same incident. So just time and time again, we would find these little incidents popping up again and again. Um, and eventually they gave up. 
And these are actually some of the people who are on that WhatsApp conversation actually being taken away, surrendering to the uh, Erdogan supporters. Um, and just things started falling apart. And you could see as they were falling apart, uh, they were saying the taxing group, who were basically taxing the main square in Istanbul, they couldn't take it because of the protests you can see here. And they're saying, for as long as we hold out. Uh, and there's one really interesting incident. So someone, a journalist was at Taksim Square doing a live report. And as he was doing the live report, some jets flew over, uh, basically buzzed them. And just after that happened, there was a WhatsApp message saying, the plane's worked for Taksim, it's calm now. So we can use all these different soft, these uh, sources to cross-reference it. So they had other considerations, like they were considering an air assault on bridge two, you know, bombing the people who were protesting on the bridge, but it all fell apart. And they started saying that, has the operation been canceled? Yes, commander, we're quitting. Meaning, yes, the commander, the operation is aborted. Shall we escape? And here they make a fatal mistake. They say, stay alive, co commander, the choice is yours. We have not decided yet, but we have left our position. I'm closing the group. Delete the messages if you want. Probably should have deleted the messages. Uh, did they take the head of the snake? Erdogan, no, they didn't. And then people just leave one after another, forgetting to delete their messages. And based off that, we were able to reconstruct the night using their, basically their story as they were telling it on what's up to each other, using open source information and prove that that, audio, that intercepted um, conversation on that phone was genuine. Um, I'm gonna end now with a case study um, looking at bombing in Syria. This uh, tweet was published in March 2017. It was the first indication that there had been a mosque bombed in Syria. Now, um, this isn't something that's unfortunately too uncommon in Syria, and usually Russia and Syria are blamed for it. Um, what was different with this is this piece of debris was recovered from the site. And this is not from any Russian or Syrian bomb. This is from a US Hellfire missile. And we've seen this same kind of missile used before in other US strikes. Um, this is one that was also in Syria. So we know they're being used in Syria, even the weight is the same. The weight is actually quite unusual because it's a, um, there's no documented Hellfire missile that weighs this size. So this is actually a new type of Hellfire missile, which was an uh, interesting element as well. And we were seeing lots of photographs and videos showing lots of civilians killed, this destroyed building. To us, it looked like a mosque. Everyone on the ground was saying it was a mosque. Um, but the US published this statement. And they said that, in fact, they had uh, an airstrike on the Al-Qaeda in Syria meeting location, killing several terrorists. But everything we were saying was saying that was wrong. There was no sign of any kind of military equipment. There was lots of people saying it was the, um, just before the call to prayer, after an evening uh, lesson in the mosque. Um, dozens of people had been killed. But America still insisted that they hadn't hit a mosque. They published this now saying that they believe that dozens of Al-Qaeda terrorist leaders were killed. So they've gone from several terrorists to dozens of leaders, and this was the mosque that everyone's talking about, completely undamaged. And we had seen this mosque in the videos, and we could say this was undamaged, but everything pointed towards the building next to it also being a mosque. Um, so what we did is we gathered all the open source evidence of using all the techniques I've just shown you. We worked with Human Rights Watch, who talked to people on the ground. We worked with an organization called Forensic Architecture that I think has been mentioned a few times here. And we basically used all this information to uh, reconstruct what happened, piece together the evidence and show that this was definitely a mosque that was bombed. On March 16th, 2017, at around 6.55 p.m., a U.S. airstrike targeted Sayyidina Omar ibn al-Khattab Mosque in al Jina, in the province of Aleppo, Syria, while almost 300 people were gathering for the Aisha night prayers. The Syrian Civil Defense, also known as the White Helmets, claimed to have recovered the bodies of 38 civilians. Five of them were children. The U.S. Central Command claimed responsibility for the airstrike, stating, U.S. forces conducted an airstrike on an Al-Qaeda in Syria meeting on March 16th, killing several terrorists, wrongly locating it in Idlib, Syria. The following day, the Pentagon released an image of the building after the strike, claiming it was a partially constructed community meeting hall, that dozens of core Al-Qaeda terrorists were killed, that they deliberately did not target the mosque at the left edge of the photo, and that initial assessments did not indicate civilian casualties. Our investigation seeks to establish what was the use of the building, were there civilian casualties, and how did the incident unfold in time and space. 
Using available and sourced imagery, videos, satellite photographs, and survivor testimonies, we began analyzing the building before and after the strike. We have identified two large craters in the north part of the building. Munitions experts confirmed they are consistent with two 500-pound bombs. We obtained a video of the building recorded two months prior to its destruction. On the roof is the Adhan speaker, used for the call to prayer. A sign next to the entrance reads, Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab Mosque. We asked a local photographer to document the interior after the strike. The mosque's entrance sign is still by the door. Shelves for worshippers' shoes indicate it is a mosque. as do the rugs and the mihrab, where the imam leads the prayer, which clearly indicate that contrary to U.S. statements, the building is a large and fully functioning mosque. We interviewed and exchanged architectural plans with the building's original contractor and caretaker, who was also wounded in the strike. The upper floor, he said, contained the imam's flat. His wife was at home and was killed in the strike. The ground floor contained the main prayer hall in the south, as well as the ritual washing room, the toilets, the kitchen, and the winter prayer hall in the north part. The strike took place just as a religious seminar in the winter prayer hall was finishing up. Some 40 to 50 people were still there. Others were gathering in the main prayer hall in preparation for the night prayer. A video taken during the construction of the building verifies witness testimonies regarding the layout and use of each room. There were no doors enclosing the winter prayer hall in the north making it an unlikely place of an Al-Qaeda senior leader meeting. Two bombs hit the northern part of the building. A large number of people started to flee the building. As they evacuated, they were targeted by several missiles. An anonymous U.S. official confirmed the use of four Hellfire missiles. We interviewed the director of the White Helmets rescue operation, Mohammed Hallaq. Halak described seeing 20 to 30 people scattered between the building and the road. Other witnesses confirmed this account. After the first strike, people went outside, and as they fled, they were struck in the streets. The plane was monitoring the place. It wanted to kill everyone who tried to get out. Those who immediately fled, people from surrounding areas who came to the rescue, they all got hit outside and torn into pieces. Many died in that strike. While sharing screens over Skype calls, Halak told us where they found victims within the rubble. Eleven people were injured. They were found in these locations. Eight people inside the building died as a result of the two blasts. We know the location of seven. <laughs> حتى في التصوير التصوير موجود يعني
In this clip, Halak is seen pulling out 14-year-old Muhammad Arabi. He later died of his injuries. We found and analyzed markings on the road that indicate the traces of Hellfire missiles, identifiable by their distinct fragmentation pattern and by remnants found nearby. This confirms witness testimonies regarding secondary strikes on evacuees. Um, so we each wrote our separate reports, Human Rights Watch, Bellingcat, and um, Forensic Architecture. Um, Human Rights Watch sent their report to US Central Command and asked for a comment. And they said that they acknowledged that the draft Human Rights Watch report could not have taken into account the classified information available to US authorities. Um, this may help explain why the US investigation reached a different conclusion. Um, which is obviously a bit of an annoying reply to get when you've just shown them all that kind of stuff. Um, but in fact, a few weeks later, they actually admitted they had actually bombed a mosque. Um, they blamed various internal failings. Um, they still said they were certain it was an Al-Qaeda meeting location. Um, they still claim only one civilian was killed in the attack, which was still more, one more than they claimed originally. Um, but um, it clearly demonstrated that the story that they were telling was untrue that there was a lot going on there that they've ignored. When they did their own investigation, they didn't speak to a single person on the ground. They only spoke to uh, US military staff. Um, but we were able to show that this was a mosque and that it was bombed by US forces. Um, so to end, again, if you'd like to learn how to more about open source investigation, uh, please um, follow the link. Um, I think there's very limited spaces, so um, this might be your only chance. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Wow. I heard people laughing a lot. Why do you think that is? I, I think it's because there's something, something inherently absurd about some of the work we do. And it's something I recognize quite a lot. I mean, we're, Bellingcat mostly works at home um, on their laptops from their sofa. We don't have like a big fancy office or anything like that. Uh, not yet, anyway. Um, but, um, you know, the last few weeks we've had the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, say we're foreign intelligence. We've had the Russian Foreign Ministry Affairs spokesperson saying we're Western intelligence. And, you know, we're just like at home on our sofas. We've nothing to do with intelligence. So it's just, a, it just the absurdity of the situation is something I think people find amusing sometimes. I think l looking at some of the work you do reminded me of what my, a, a hobby my daughters have, like looking at two pictures and spotting 10 differences, but then the adult version of it, what type of personality should you have to engage in this work? I also have, I've literally used that same description multiple times. So right. You are exactly right. A lot of this is just a big grown up version of Spot the Difference. You know, stuff like the uh, looking at the satellite imagery for the same video that you found in the Russian MOD. It is a variation of that, but it does take a kind of, I definitely find the best investigators are the right kind of people with the right amount of obsessiveness but also they haven't gone so obsessive that they end up sending parcel bombs to American politicians. You, it's that right level you've got to get, and sometimes that's a very fine thing. Um, but it, the thing is, it's also really addictive, solving these little puzzles and going through them. Um, maybe it's just me speaking, but it's like last night I said, I, you know, I spent four hours looking at that guy's Twitter account, because it was just, to me, fascinating, all the different aspects of it, where he was getting information from, what inspired him, how he was interacting with people. And there's kind of little stories there as well. I mean, one thing I didn't cover there is he sent a lot of threatening message to women on Twitter who were critical of Trump, especially high profile women. Um, and they all reported him and Twitter did nothing about it. And this happened, it appears to have happened multiple times. So there's now a question of why did Twitter not stop this kind of behavior? Should Twitter have stopped that kind of behavior? People are rude to each other all the time on Twitter, but they don't all turn out to be mass bombers. But that's like one question. There's the question about that weird silences consent website, which seems fishy to me. I haven't looked into it, but I want to look into it. But there's all these little aspects from just looking at his Twitter feeds that's interesting. And then there's, there's multiple Facebook accounts, videos of him at Trump rallies, all kinds of stuff like that. So there's this whole story going on through his social media history that we can check and verify and you know, might spin off to other interesting things.
So, so how many hours a day are you pouring over this stuff? I mean, does it keep you from sleeping? And apparently last night it did. Well, yeah, last night I, I stayed up way too late. Do you eat? Like do you sleep? Do you? Well, I, you have I, a life. I have a young family at home, so I don't get the, um, you know, get a chance to spend my entire life doing it. But yeah. um, I think for me... Um, I mean, I, now because Bellingcat's grown a lot, we have 10 full-time employees, we're facing this issue um, that a lot of growing organizations have where the founder becomes the person who does all the paperwork. And I do all the bank recs, I issue invoices, I chase payments, I do all that boring stuff. Um, and everyone, all my staff are now doing all the fun investigations. So actually, last night was actually a fun time for me, as strange as that sounds, being able to sit down and go through some Twitter account for four hours. It was very exciting. So how do you deal with too much information because I can imagine looking into the case like you did last night you would you would just keep digging and digging and digging and then understanding that three weeks have passed yeah I mean do, do you have to start with some sort of hypothesis before you dive into such a thing like that it varies I mean that's an interesting case because it's a guy who's very active on social media and now is part of a big news story so there is an awful lot to dig through but with that I basically took a very systematic approach of Let's just go through his tweets one by one. And by looking at that very first tweet, it actually tells you a lot about him and his personality and how he was acting online. So with that, you should really, when you've got like a complex thing like that, just be systematic about your approach. Um, sometimes it's understanding where information comes from in certain incidents. So like in Syria, the way in which social media is used is very kind of um, systematic in rebel-held areas. There's like media centers and armed groups. They have Twitter accounts, Facebook pages, and YouTube channels. And you, if you, there's been an incident, you can go there and find pretty much 95% of the information you're going to find about that incident that's going to be online. With MH17, it was completely different because Ukraine had to open social media, so people were posting all kinds of things. So then you're digging through vast amounts of social media channels, but you try and narrow it down. So we use the photographs and the videos of the missile launcher to get the route, and then we looked at online communities of people who lived along that route to see if they were discussing it, and we found more people finding stuff. And you also have a community of people doing the same thing. As with MH17 and this bomber, you have people who are just digging into stuff, sharing stuff, and you can see what other people have found as well. But again, you have to double check what they found to make sure it's actually genuine. How you're not Bellingcat is not a huge group of people, although you get help from other people. How do you how do you make a selection? What what puts up a flag saying this is a Bellingcat story? We should take months to dive into this. Um, so initially when Bellingcat was launched, I was basically the only full-time employee and everyone else was volunteers. So yeah. I basically said, just write about what you find interesting. Um, but we launched Bellingcat on July 14th, 2014. So MH17 happened three days later. Um, and that acted as a catalyst both for the work of Bellingcat and the open source kind of like the whole field, in fact, because we then had a police investigation. We had this big high profile case. Russia was lying about it constantly, so there was a lot to fact check there. Uh, there was doubts about the Ukrainian side as well, so there was a whole bunch of stuff that was going on there that um, you know really um, changed how even I was working, because before I was working quite by myself. And that led to me creating a kind of investigation team, which we, we call it, it's our Slack channel. But it's about 25 of us that now work collaboratively on different projects. Mm -hmm. um, and until recently, I didn't have money to hire them, and I've now been able to hire a lot of them. But still, I kind of say, just work on what you find interesting. Because I find you get much more interesting reporting um, if it's by someone who's kind of obsessed with the subject. Because they'll it's like we have people who've followed MH17 in minute detail for the past four years. I mean, we've, we've got another... A uh, big piece on it coming out in a couple of weeks as well. So there's constantly stuff we're finding and figuring out and publishing about. Um, and just because these people are really interested in the subject, really engaged. So when something new comes out, it, to most people it might not mean anything, but to the people who are kind of obsessed about it, they can say, ah, this actually links to these other 10 things. And that means we can understand something else now. So and are you looking for new people to join Bellingcat, like in, in specific countries? We don't have anyone with expertise or obsessiveness about this type of subject. Um, it's it's not so much that now. I mean, we have a lot of people now emailing me saying, hey, can I volunteer for Bellingcat? But right. because of the way we're structured at the moment, it's not possible to really take volunteers on like that. What I say to people is kind of just go and do it. Do a, your own website, your own little blog. It's easy to do. Do what I did when I started. Just do it. And then... You know, if so, you, you do it and you stick with it and you come back to me saying, I've done this for a while, yeah. then that's the kind of person I'm looking for. 
Some of the, uh, most of what I've seen here is this very extremely compelling evidence. Some of the stuff that I've read online on Bellingcat was like, okay, I, I see two of these pictures and there's circles around it, but still, do I, do I really trust this guy or not? So how, when you're comparing blurry pictures taken from different angles, how can, we, how can you be sure that you're right? When is the right time to publish and say we're like 100% sure or 99% sure? Um, well, I mean, it varies a lot. I mean, sometimes something is, is, is clear as day. Sometimes it's just so obvious. Yeah. Um, but even then, we kind of try and go an extra mile because one thing I've learned over the past six years is there's plenty of people on social media who will tell you the obvious is not obvious, that you've, you know, it's clearly photoshopped or there's something else wrong with it. Um, it's like when we were doing the um, investigation into the Skripal killers. We found multiple photographs. That, that basically, one of the guys is a hero of Russia, and that is old military unit, his pictures on the wall under their heroes of Russia. Um, and it fe is featured in several photographs of people visiting this museum. Um, but the people who were attacking Ballincat were saying, well, these are all fake photographs. But these are photographs that were posted online three or four years ago. So we kind of said, well, these are all old. And then they said, well, obviously, you've hacked the servers and planted it on there. And then they said, oh, we said, well, it's on archive.org. It was archived in 2016. But this must be so frustrating. It is, but then you, you kind of, I, I've had to learn um, not to engage so much with people on social media. If you follow me on social media, you see I fail with that every single day. Um, but And sometimes I just want to have an argument with people who are talking about conspiracy theories. But I really try not to do that too much because it's a dis huge distraction. But also there is this kind of dynamic online where you do have these communities of people who um, basically over the years, it, it's basically separate communities. It's kind of like the Venn diagram of all these different communities that kind of uh, stop the war, kind of anti-imperialists, pro-acid, pro-Russia, um, uh, kind of the alt-right, the alt-left, like all these different communities are actually, like the Venn diagram is drawing closer together because they're starting to use the same sources, the same websites. Um, and it's, it's created this kind of echo chamber effect, but it's, it crosses a lot of these different communities. But now you have people who are um, pro-Trump who are also really pro-Assad because they saw Hillary Clinton as being the person who was going to bomb Assad, therefore Trump was a good guy. Right. So when Trump bombed Syria, they were very upset about that and decided like the deep state had got to him. But you have a network of personalities and websites from like David Icke, um, you know, to more mainstream figures like uh, Seymour Hirsch, for example, he's kind of part of this kind of um, he, he's kind of part of this narrative building around Syria now. But you can actually see this happening over time. There's, if you want to look into this, there was a very good um, piece written by someone called Kate Starbird um, about the white helmets, and she talks about how these communities talk about the white helmets and spread information about them. And you can actually, she visualizes it, and it's these same communities that are spreading information about, you know, Donald Trump and, um, you know, Putin and all kinds of stuff like that. It's the same communities kind of drawing together over these topics. So, but back to, back to Balancat's work, how much of it is actual science? How much of it is like gut feeling and instinct? Um, I, I don't know about saying science. Um, I mean, it's very hard to measure because often what we're doing is we're saying, look, this, these, these are the clues we have that tells us that this thing is this or it's that. And based off the amount of information we have, we talk about how certain we are. Often if you read Bellingcat, we say it's, it's certain, it's very certain, it's almost certain. We're using very specific language there to explain how sure we are. And like if we were talking about um, a, a lot of um, early kind of open source investigators. We didn't really have words to describe what we were doing, so we were talking about it as OSINT, open source intelligence, and it's really not, but part of open, any intelligence is talking about the certainty of something. Yep. So in a way, we adopted that language to say how certain we're about things. Um, and often when you're, if you're kind of someone who's, you know, hostile to Bell and Cat, and you see us saying it's very likely, they go, aha, they're only saying it's very likely, therefore it must be certain it's not true. It's so funny that you're adopting the same language, so you're becoming more and more like the civic version of the intelligence agency. I, I think what it was m more of, the people who started doing this originally, it was organizations like Storyful, who were based in Dublin, and they did a lot of verification. And we kind of didn't have our own language to describe how we were doing certain things. Like the first Libya example I showed you, I said it was geolocation. I didn't know it was called geolocation. I was just looking at Google Maps and looking for mosques. I had, we didn't have the language. So early on, I think a lot of language was 
uh, adopted from yeah. the open source intelligence community because that was like the only people who'd been doing this stuff before. So what we, and then it, now what we're trying to call it is online open source investigation um, to make it very distinct from intelligence. Because when you're talking about intelligence, you're actually talking about creating an intelligence product and that's not necessarily what you're doing with online open source investigation. I'm going to open up the room for questions, but I have one question that I wanted to ask you. Um, first, Bellingcat, you sp sometimes you spend months on checking facts, finding the truth, but then these communities online, as you describe them, they won't believe anything. And, and also it's very hard, we, of course, we live in this post-truth world where it's becoming more and more normal that like governments of countries that we used to trust, they lie on a daily basis. Isn't it? frustrating to dig up these slithers of truths um, within a sea of lies. I mean, how much of an impact can you have then? Well, one example I like to use is, um, uh, I think it was last year or maybe earlier this year, there was an um, Indian journalist who posted a video, and she described it as um, US coalition forces attacking an ISIS convoy. Um, it quickly transpired that this video was actually from a computer game. Um, and it was it looked like drone footage, but it was from a computer game and there was a video of it online and she just she got like 10,000 retweets and I quote tweeted it saying this is from a video game and of course it got 100 retweets because you know the fact checks never gets more than the actual piece <laughs> of nonsense. Um, the thing is I'm followed by lots of journalists and people interested in Russia and a couple of weeks later Russia posts um, a tweet and it says irrefutable evidence that the US is hi helping ISIS flee. And one of the pictures they used was a screenshot from the same computer game video. Um, and because people had already seen that on my feed and they followed Russia, they immediately replied with a link to the video saying this is from a computer game. And it was like they'd been inoculated against a piece of false information. And it wasn't because it was a Russian false inf information to start with, they'd seen it somewhere else. Um, and it's the first time I've ever seen the Russian Ministry of Defense retract information and apologize. They, they basically blamed it on an intern who put the, it was complete nonsense, but, <laughs> but I think there's always gonna be a situation, you always have a community who think, believes in conspiracies or you know, this and that that you disagree with or you know, is patently untrue. That will always exist, and you can't fight against that, really. But what you can say, in a way, you can inoculate other people against this nonsense. So when someone starts sharing a meme that's been debunked, they have a link and they say, reply to it, actually it's been untrue. I'm sure the person they're replying to doesn't care, but someone reading that might see that. And it actually might discourage the person who's using it from using that same meme in the future. And some of this stuff is used to you know, demonize all kinds of people and bodies. And it's not just about how in the West we're using social media, but in other countries it's being used to really fuel violence. And what's a real threat now is you're starting to have more usage of closed social networks where people kind of trust the content on their closed social network more. So if a false piece of information is shared, that, can, uh, you know, that, that doesn't get countered. And what's becoming a risk now in certain countries is it's being used to fuel violence against ethnic minorities. Um, and I, I think, you know, that this engagement, uh, you know, is important because it can, you know, change the messaging around something and actually even pre prevent violence. As a vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to open up the room for questions. There was the light. I think lights are already on, but I need to check. Anyone who dares, there are people here with microphones. Yes, there's one coming up in the front. Hello, um, my name is Teresa. Um, I have two questions. So um, the first question is, um, how do you select your clients? And the second is, did you ever work for a client that you felt like kind of, is it really working against an enemy or did you work for the enemy? Because you know, you work contains a big responsibility for people. And I know from forensic architecture and talks I've seen that they were heavily criticized also for the clients they, they chose to work for. And I just wanted to know what you have to say about this. Um, we, we don't actually work for clients, really. We kind of just do whatever we want to do, which is a fantastic position to be in. Um, I mean, what really drives our choices of what we're working on is basically the staff members at Bellingcat finding stuff they're interested in. So um, I, I should explain how we're funded as well, just because you're talking about clients. So about 50% of our income comes from um, workshops that we run on a monthly basis. 
Um, the other 50% comes from um, the National Endowment for Democracy, the Open Societies Foundation, um, Adesium, uh, which is a Dutch foundation, um, and we're currently looking for more, even more diverse funding because we're trying to get it from as many different sources as possible so it can never be said we're relying on one source of funding. But with the workshop funding, that actually helps a tremendous amount because that's not tied to any uh, grants, so we can kind of be really flexible with that, and it, it's kind of being a lifesaver really for us. So you, you pose your own questions. You, you don't rely on other people, clients, who... Yeah, I mean, usually if we're working with other people, it's because we found an interesting topic like the Algin and Moss bombing, yeah. and we've reached out to people we think we could work with on it. Right. Um, if we ever have a media partner, it's usually because we need a publishing partner to maybe do something a bit extra, like um, when we identified um, one of the MH17 suspects, um, I think it was Orion, and we did this voice print of him. That analysis was quite expensive, so our publishing partner paid for that side of it. We did most of the research and they you know, got to pay for it. So, um, but we're happy to have that co those partnerships. Uh, they are in front. Hi, I'm Maraya. Um, the things you do, I think a lot of governments are, well, really pissed off right now. Um, uh, do you notice that a little bit on, of course, on Twitter, but also on uh, outside? Do they, somebody knocks on your door or, I don't know, leaves a horse's head on your doorstep or something? Now, I make a joke out of it, but I yeah. think maybe sometimes you and your team are confronted with less fun things but do you notice or is it just things on Twitter and are they, are they hacking your computer or um, well for the real life stuff um, I mean it's like this week because of the scripple stuff I've had the police coming to my house to kind of make sure I'm safe and um, it's like now if I someone calls a, anything to our house there's a note on the system explaining who we are and because if I have to explain to a police officer who I am and they don't know, they're going to think I'm insane. So um, it's a really so so. There's that aspect of it. I mean, the only the thing that worries me more are kind of not so much like Russian agents coming to assassinate me, but just some random crazy person on Twitter deciding that it's you know my time to die. I mean, it's like this guy who's been doing these bombs. I mean, he's just a you know crazy person on Twitter, but he starts sending bombs to people. So it's like, it's like I'll be moving house soon and we'll be having a more secure home with like a big wall and stuff. But we've been attacked. Um, I mean, like I said, Sergei Lavrov's attacked our work. Um, Russian Foreign Ministry, the UK Embassy has said we're Rus Western intelligence. First they were saying we're amateurs, you don't know what we're doing. Now we're apparently Western intelligence. So we've been upgraded in their eyes. Um, we've had um, Fancy Bear, the, who uh, apparently the GRU, uh, trying multiple phishing attacks in our website on 2015, 2016, and towards the end of 2017. Like, like in 2017, every day, myself and a few other Bellingcat members on Gmail would get, say, three or four phishing emails, and that, again, was tied back to Fancy Bear. We've had the Cyber Burkett hack our website. We have had been attacked in the Russian media. Russia Today loves me and will cover me slightest thing I say, I, they will write an article about it. Um, but I, I think it says a lot that the articles they write about uh, me are tend to be, like the last one they wrote about me was about me being rude to people on Twitter and calling them idiots, which I, is my hobby. But um, they did a whole article on it. And it's like, if that's all they can find about me to write an article on, then they clearly haven't got much arguments against our actual investigative work. Good. Man in the blue shirt over there. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Roger. Um, my question to you is, how, can, can you talk a little bit about how well you're connected with uh, technologists, um, coders, developers? Um, because it seems to me like the, the, the time-intensive part of the work you do, uh, a large part of that can be automated. And I'm just wondering to what extent you have access to that. And if you would have one thing you'd like to see automated, what would it be? Nice. Um, I mean, we don't actually have that much access to it. I mean, people have kind of approached us and then it's never really turned into anything. Partly that's because Bellingcat's, you know, everyone at Bellingcat's so busy, we don't have time to do a project. I'm hoping in the coming months that'll be less of an issue. Um, I mean, one thing I really like we were looking at is um, when we investigated MH17, we looked at the 53rd Air Defense Brigade in Russia because we believe that's where the missile launcher came from. And in fact, 
we think we've confirmed it's where the missile launcher came from. Part of that was two people spending a year looking at all the social media accounts connected um, to people who might have been part of this military unit trying to figure out who was who. And they're able to piece together every single member of that unit from that, but it took them a year. A lot of that was just opening links and looking at pictures and looking for people who look like soldiers. That, you know, if you could train an AI, an AI to say, find people in uniform, is that too hard a task to do? And then point them at a social network and have them run through it and find all the most likely accounts. Um, so I think it could be very useful kind of like for triage, so like say what's a priority to look at. Um, we're still always gonna wanna look at every single part of the process, because a big part for of us is explaining how the process is done. And if a computer's doing it, we're probably not gonna be able to explain that very well. But I think there is a role where that can play, and we haven't really explored that too much at the moment. But if you're offering, then yes, we'd be very interested. <laughs> Last two questions. Here's one, in the, and then two rows behind you. I've seen you. Yes. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I was wondering if um, your investigations have been um, picked up by any prosecutors, or if you yourself has, have testified as an expert witness in a trial and if so, um, could you explain a bit about the, um, the implications or the challenges these forms of um, investigations and evidences um, provide in a, in a courtroom, in a trial? Um, I may take about an hour answering this, I'm afraid. I'll keep it as short as I can. Um, so um, one thing I've been doing a lot is working with the International Criminal Court um, for the past couple of years about their use of open source material, both for investigation and as evidence. Um, you may have seen, I, I didn't use it in this presentation because it's very strong imagery, but there was a series of execution videos published by a uh, commander in uh, Libya, um, a guy called Lafali, and those um, Facebook videos were actually used by the International Criminal Court to issue an arrest warrant. Um, that was a really unique circumstance because usually these arrest warrants are issued years after the crimes have been committed, yet here it was as it was happening. And that for them was a starting point. It wasn't, oh, we've got the videos, case closed, that allowed them to start looking for witnesses and other information to support their case. But they could issue this arrest warrant and it actually stopped him from, for a little while, doing executions. Um, so there's kind of from an, you know, that initial investigation perspective, it can be very useful. The question then comes to how do we preserve this as evidence? Um, people talk about chain of custody a lot when they're talking about this. And there is this perception that if something's posted on social media, you're gonna need the whole chain of custody from when it was on the camera to when it was posted on social media. That's not necessarily true, and it depends from case to case what witnesses you got. And no lawyer is gonna use a piece of social media by itself to build a case. They'll look for witnesses, they'll contact the original person, there'll be everything around that. Now, um, and, and we've had, I've had years of discussion about this and it's, it is a really big topic because there's different courts and different standards of evidence. You've now got the IIIM on Syria that's been set up by the UN General Assembly, which is gathering evidence. And they have a massive data management task because it's like the Syrian archive, a website that's archiving videos from Syria, it's working with YouTube videos, they've got over a million videos already. And that's not even the stuff that's offline, which there's hundreds of terabytes of videos from various organizations who've worked on the ground. And the IIIM needs to organize that to make it usable for prosecutions. So there's a massive data management task there, which is also something we've been working on with various groups. Um, as for Bellingcat, I mean, one thing with open source material, it's publicly available. So we don't necessarily have to be the expert witness that says this is a piece of social media and here's what it means, because the police have their own investigators who check this. And I think this is what we're going to find with the um, joint investigation team and MH17. They're going to review all the evidence that we've shared publicly and that we've given them, and they'll um, do their own analysis of it. And they'll choose to use it or not and have their own experts talking about it. Um, I have been asked to be a witness in a couple of the private actions for um, MH17, like the European Court of Human Rights case. Um, so far, that's because of the way the European Court of Human Rights works. That's basically me making a very detailed statement about our work. Um, so we've yet to be called as expert witnesses. One thing that was very interesting is um, a year or two ago, do you, have you heard of the Sevchenko trial in Russia? A Ukrainian service woman who was effectively kidnapped from what everyone said, pulled across the border and put on trial um, after some journalists were killed by a mortar attack from the Ukrainian side of the border. Um, during that trial, the Russian uh, prosecutors called a witness uh, who was an expert in um, analysis of craters. 
And he used what he described as the Bellingcat method to analyze craters to prove Ukraine had been firing into Russia. And he, it was a method that we had used previously to show that Russia had been firing into Ukraine. The great thing about this is this is now um, a Russian court accepting this as evidence. And there's now cases of Russia versus Ukraine using our analysis of the craters to say they were firing from Russia into Ukraine. And now we have a Russian court that says it's a valid method of investigation. So, um, you know, that's probably the only time an expert has witness has been cited as using Bellingcat in court, and it's turned out to be rather useful for other people. Um, I, I promised someone to ask a last question, final question. Is that possible? Keep the question short and the answer as well, please. Oh, sure. Thank you very Good much luck. for your um, presentation. Um, perhaps this is a trivial question, but since the subtitle of the of the of the title of the talk or of the presentation was um, fact checking in a post truth world, I wonder if you would have an advice for a lay person, for a non professional fact checker, for non a person that doesn't do this as a you know as a professional activity. What how what would be um, the way to go about fact checking. You know, if, if your friend posts something on Facebook and as you said, when it posted in a, in a closer environment, it, it becomes much more sort of effective. Okay. Um, I mean, the first thing you could do is check fact checking websites uh, like uh, Snopes, for example. They'll, they often have a fact check for a lot of this stuff. Um, search on Google for the description they've used. It doesn't have to be the exact words. So if it's a meme about a very specific thing, you might find a fact-checking website's already looked into it, like PolitiFact or um, Pointer as well has been quite good at it. So that's a good place to start. Then if you want to do your own fact-checking, that's where it starts getting more complicated. But um, if someone shares an image saying it's a thing, do a reverse image search of the image and see if it's actually the thing they claim it is. Um, that is like the most simplest thing you can do. Yet even there's professional journalists who don't even bother doing that before they share a picture. But they're learning because of the amount of people who jump on them when they do. So start with the fact-checking sites and reverse image search like crazy. Um, so there's a three-day course you're going to give for the impact fest for people yes, who are interested. Yes, you may have heard about that. Uh, the work looks so impressive that I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if there's anyone who still thinks they can do this as well. How, does it does it's, it work in three days? Is that enough? Yeah, it's it's actually really easy. That's the secret. A lot of this really? is just it's more about perseverance than any clever genius skills you need. I mean, if you look at what I just showed you, a lot of it is just looking at pictures, and we can all look at pictures, can't we? Thank you so much, Elliot Higgins. Thank you.